The 1990s, a decade where alternative thinking and ideas became mainstream, one of which is questioning those with higher authority and what secrets they may be keeping from the public. The truth is out there. The X-Files is a series that might be the defining show of the 1990s, at least in America and in live action. It's a show that I've been meaning to watch for a couple years now, and I felt the pressure to watch it when the revival started airing a few years back. But better late than never, as they say. It's time I give a non-nostalgic fair review of The X-Files, and to see if it still holds up 18 years after its initial run ended. You know, I got so used to how TV shows are nowadays with each season having about 10 episodes or so, they can have a more straightforward pace of the overall season and use the budget and resources to make those 10-ish episodes what they need to be from a budgetary concern. Nothing feels like filler, but I can't say the same for this show as back in the 1990s they would air a new episode every week from fall of the current year to the beginning of summer of the next year so there was a number of filler episodes that weren't necessary to watch so I used a guide to get me through filler and watch the episodes that are needed to understand the X-Files and a lot of the acclaimed standalone episodes. I know that some may say that my opinion is invalidated because I didn't watch all 201 episodes but come on my time is scarce. With that out of the way on with the review. Series creator Chris Carter was influenced by Kolchak, The Night Stalker, and The Twilight Zone. It's no wonder this series spoke to me in a sense. The series starts with the FBI assigning medical doctor Dana Scully to disprove Fox Mulder's and the X-Files findings, which ends up not happening as Scully remains a skeptic, but stays on as Mulder's partner. The X-Files pilot is a great example of how you pull in audiences from the start, such a great way to start out the series. After that, most episodes are mainly episodic standalone episodes with mythology episodes, aka two-parters, being at the beginning, middle, and at the end of each respective season. The series delves into the paranormal and unknown. Fox Mulder, also known as Spooky Mulder throughout season one, is the believer out of the two because he witnessed his sister getting abducted at a young age. Ever since she went missing, he's been searching for the answers to what happened to her and her whereabouts. He's got a dry wit to him and he's just an easygoing guy up until he tries to uncover the truth, which at times gets him into a lot of trouble with the Bureau and a lot of narrow escapes. You could say he's obsessed and it consumes him sometimes. Scully, on the other hand, is a skeptic. She only believes in the scientific and logical explanation. That's where these two don't butt heads, but they're each other's foils, which leads to some interesting dialogue exchanges. It's not saying that she's cold and calculating, she just believes in what can be proven and what hasn't been proven. Scully's journey begins in the first episode, and from there manifests, she's the one with the arc. She clicks with Mulder pretty fast and the two become friends early on despite having different beliefs about unexplained events. She also doesn't witness a lot of the things Mulder does in season 1. The overall antagonists of the series are those that try to hide the truth, and one episode in particular involving CSM really fleshes out what kind of people Mulder and Scully are clashing with. Walter Skinner is who Mulder and Scully report to at the end of each case. We don't see him every episode, but he is a non-believer of the X-Files. As the show goes on, he is a valued friend and ally. The Lone Gunmen are a group of hackers and allies of Mulder and Scully after being introduced. These three are really entertaining with their back and forth and how they interact with the two main leads, eventually getting more screen time and guest appearances as the series goes on. They even went on to get episodes revolving around them, which were some of my favorite, and a spin-off series in 2001. The writing for the series is good throughout the first few seasons. I do feel that the show caught on with audiences fast because it was something not done yet at the time for television. The first two seasons, while they had interesting concepts and a lot of good episodes, there was also a number of hiccups, but when I feel the show hit its prime is between the halfway point of season 2 to the time the movie released, arguably to the end of season 6. Now, there's a lot of memorable episodes, but my favorite hands down is Season 4, Episode 2, titled Home. 
an episode brimming with something the X-Files hadn't done too much up to that point, horror. Glenn Morgan and James Wong wrote the episode and are my kind of guys. Speaking of writers, Darren Morgan was the writer that delivered some of the X-Files' most unique episodes, writing for the show during season 2 and 3. Vince Gilligan wrote some of the best episodes in later seasons, one of which is the prototype for a show that would later go on to be, arguably, the best TV show ever. BITCH! There's a lot of good writing involved during the show's run and concepts that work well, but the show can also have some nonsensical writing too, along with episodes that are boring. See, when I said I watched the show with a guide, I didn't do that until the beginning of season 2. I watched the entire first season, and there was quite a bit of snoozers in that season, which is why I resorted to the guide. I should have saw that coming after all 201 episodes of a series doesn't mean that product is good in its entirety. Remember, quality over quantity. The casting for the series called for the actors to be unknowns so that way it felt like it was happening to everyday people. Good choice as it gave actors with not much credibility their time to showcase what they can do. That is until season 6, but I'll talk about that later on. When the series premiered, it made the cast and creators big names almost instantaneously during the first couple of seasons. David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson are perfectly casted in these roles and have really good on-screen chemistry. Mark Snow composed one of the best TV soundtracks that I've ever heard. It's very memorable, ominous, and it sets the tone for a lot of episodes. It's atmospheric. In 1998, the series had just released a theatrical movie, and the series was top dog on the network. So you know at that point, when you're at the top, you're gradually going to go down, unless you decide to end it then and there. The gradual fall started in season six when david duchovny campaigned to move filming which was done in canada for the first five seasons and to move it to la so he could remain closer to his wife tia leone and get feature film work longtime series director kim manners and Gillian anderson were for it just not as vocally as dave duchovny series creator chris carter was against it yet dave duchovny still got his way and it was off to california for the x-files a lot of fans saw this as the X-Files going Hollywood. <sighs> really guys? A TV series isn't Hollywood? A theatrical movie release of the same name isn't Hollywood? I... I'm just saying. Now, just because they simplified a number of plots for season 6 and on to reel in new viewers doesn't mean they aren't good. Convoluted does not equal good writing. Simplicity is sometimes all you need. Anyway, because of the move to California, plots were more comedic or romantic for the general public, I presume. More well-known actors such as Bruce Campbell guest starred. I don't see a problem with this. I love Bruce Campbell. And viewership was on the slow decline because of these factors. Some of the cast and crew thought that season 7 would be the final season. If only. So because of this, season 7 wrapped up a lot of subplots and mystery of Mulder's sister. I watched the episode and I didn't feel anything. I felt like I got a good enough answer, but I wasn't sad in the slightest. Mainly because I always found a missing loved one as a motivation for characters as a really weak, lazy motivation most of the time. Unless it's executed in a manner that really affects the character. It really has to hit home. The directing has to be perfect. The writing has to be perfect. And the acting has to be perfect. All of these have to align for it to come across that it's really affecting the character. And it didn't happen for me in the X-Files. Example, Rocky Balboa missing his wife, Adrian. That hit home. In the X-Files, yeah, he went to some extreme lengths, but the execution just wasn't making my black hole of a heart respond. I felt nothing. Prior to Season 7's release, Duchovny filed a lawsuit against Fox claiming that Fox was cheating him out of syndication royalties and Chris Carter being compensated and keeping quiet about the deal. Not only did he possibly screw himself from getting work in movies, but he also screwed himself out of the show, which he was ready to leave anyway so it wasn't a loss for him. The lawsuit was soon settled out of court in 2000. While this was going, Season 7 was Mulder's last full season as a main character. Enter John Doggett, his replacement, and in the latter half 
Monica Reyes. Now I don't see what the problems are with John Daggett and Monica Reyes. Did season 8 and 9 have weaker plots? Yes. Was the show past its prime? Yeah, definitely, but it had nothing to do with the characters. There's only so much that you can do with a concept, an idea, before it overstays its welcome, or it gets itself cancelled. Aside from Chris Carter wanting to focus solely on Doggett and pushing Scully to the side, Doggett is actually a likable character despite not getting the best writing in Season 8, but he had some good moments in episodes. Part of the reason is because he's portrayed by Robert Patrick, who portrayed the T-1000 in Terminator 2 and had a fun cameo in Wayne's World. Robert Patrick, in my opinion, is an underrated actor, and his work in X-Files Season 8 and 9 showcase why I think this. Despite what he's given in Season 8, he's still giving it his all, and when the writing's there, it's a strong scene or episode. I love the friendship that Doggett and Scully have, and I ended up being a naysayer that Doggett is a bad character. He's given stronger episodes in writing in Season 9. He's a skeptic that doesn't believe, but he is someone who looks for answers. John's driving motivation is the mystery behind his dead son, and while again the loss of a loved one doesn't really do it for me unless it's perfectly executed, I felt more for the revelation of Luke than I did for Samantha. Yes, yes I know, I know, it's a very controversial opinion. Monica Reyes is a character that I think doesn't deserve much hate either. The way some fans described is that she didn't fit the series. They made her sound like she was a live action cartoon or something. Then I watched the show and said, nope, this character fits the show that she's in. Monica got some guest appearances here and there in season 8, but wasn't given a starring role until season 9. She didn't have much of an arc, but she's a likable enough character. Guys, it's been 20 years now since Duchovny left the show as main character. I think it's time to accept the fact that the reason you don't like Doggett and Reyes is because they weren't Mulder and Scully. While Mulder and Scully did have better writing and overall seasons, I really don't think that Doggett and Reyes got a fair shake. So, I started this series in April this year and I finished it in mid-August. And after all that, I have to say that the finale is one of the most disappointing and unconclusive finales that I've ever seen. What was that? Why go on for so long if you weren't going to give us the ending that would have ended it in a proper manner? I don't know what more to say about that last episode except for the fact that the truth was not revealed to the world. So if you're watching The X-Files, I'd say use a guide to determine which episodes you want to watch from seasons 1 through 5 and then watch the movie. That's probably as good of a conclusion as you're going to get. If you want to watch the seasons after season 5, there's some great episodes, but for the most part, watch at your own risk, because you're going to be tempted to watch it all the way to the finale. I will give The X-Files Original Run a recommendation. And if you're wondering, I am going to review the first movie next week. As for the second movie in seasons 10 and 11, maybe sometime next year. We'll see. I'm Lena Mars, I'm the MTA Productions crew, and the truth is out there.